Hey everybody, here's another video about Kazuo Ishiguro's Never Let Me Go. And in this video, we're gonna talk about autonomy and motherhood. In particular, we're gonna talk about the illusion of autonomy, or maybe our misplaced confidence in autonomy. So what is autonomy? By autonomy, we generally mean the capacity for self-government or self-rule. We associate autonomy with freedom, independence, rationality, and individual rights and responsibilities. But what I wanna talk about here is the way in which our sense that we are self-governing beings can sometimes lead to the belief that we are self-sufficient beings. That is, that we don't need anyone but ourselves. But are any of us really self-sufficient? Is a human being really best understood as a thing apart, alone? I want to start by fleshing out our definition of autonomy. And in order to do that, before we get into Ishiguro's novel, I need to take a bit of a trip through early modern political theory. So stay with me. The idea of autonomy in the history of philosophy is often tied to Immanuel Kant, who made it the centerpiece of his whole moral philosophy. But what I want to suggest here is that we can really trace this idea back a little bit further to the social contract theorists, Thomas Hobbes and John Locke. So the concept of autonomy really rose in stature alongside the emergence of the scientific method. And the political theory that was consequent to the scientific revolution, the stuff advanced by Thomas Hobbes and John Locke, that political theory was really founded upon and organized around the whole concept of a human individual as an autonomous being. And in their thinking, they imagined humans as, as beings that by nature were rational and self-interested. Hobbes and Locke were social contract theorists whose work really laid the groundwork for modern liberal democracies. Both Hobbes and Locke engage in different kinds of state of nature myths where they imagine human beings in a pre-political state and they imagine them in isolation for the most part. They imagine a human being in isolation, thinking by itself, working out what is going to satisfy its interests. And their theories of government involve many individuals coming together and signing a social contract Government for Hobbes, for Locke, and all social contract theorists is really just a product of many autonomous individual human beings getting together and agreeing to live alongside each other. And the thing I really want to draw your attention to here, the thing I want to put pressure on, is this concept of a human being as an indivisible unit. That a human being is a kind of self-contained thing with reason and free will, and that that human being opts in or opts out of different kinds of social or political groups. But this idea that the human being or the individual is this kind of irreducible thing, that's kind of interesting. Are there instead other ways of understanding human beings? For example, is the family or the group a better theoretical starting point than the autonomous self-governing individual? Are human beings better understood as separate distinct entities or rather as parts of a whole? Now, we ought to recognize that this conception of the autonomous individual being that I think emerges out of Hobbes and Locke does have much to recommend it. It's from these thinkers, really, that we get our whole conception of human rights. Insofar as we believe human beings are autonomous, we can see that they are rational actors who ought to have at least some control over their own lives, that they should not be enslaved or oppressed. But in Never Let Me Go, Ishiguro suggests that we might have misplaced confidence in this whole idea of human autonomy. Specifically, I think Ishiguro might be concerned with the ways that concepts of self-government or self-rule might give way to things like self-sufficiency or a sense of control or mastery over human life. In Never Let Me Go, I think Ishiguro wants to challenge our ideas of independence, individuality, separateness. And one of the ways he does this, I think, is through familial imagery. First, we need to talk about mothers. The children, the students at Hailsham, do not have mothers. They don't have families more generally, but I think the figure of the mother is particularly important here. In addition, they cannot be mothers. We know that the students of Hailsham have been sterilized. They are unable to have children of their own. Now, in one sense, this suggests the children at Hailsham are especially autonomous beings. They are cut off, separated from the very possibility of family. And the family is one of those things for all of us that should remind us that we are never totally autonomous beings. We all come from mothers. And even if we have not been raised by our biological mothers, it's impossible for us to be without a mother. Human beings are not self-generated. Someone else has to bring us into the world. 
against our choosing, right? Even before we have the capacity for choosing, we don't will ourselves into existence. And moreover, especially when we are young, our lives really depend on other people caring for us. And typically, this is the role of the family. Speaking of family, so insofar as the students from Hailsham are separated from traditional family structures, there is this way in which they are atypically autonomous. But it's noteworthy that these students seem to instinctively seek out social groups, even quasi-familial groups. Think of that episode where Kathy is found singing Never Let Me Go in her bedroom. And Ruth, in particular, seems throughout the novel to be looking for her mother. Ruth's desperate desire for a mother is really what's behind the whole childhood fantasy of Miss Geraldine's secret guard. It's also the thing that makes Ruth so excited about the road trip to Norfolk to find her possible. Ruth is especially invested in the idea of finding this older woman from whom she originates. It's especially interesting that it's Ruth who is so invested in finding a mother. Precisely because Ruth comes off as the character who is most independent, autonomous, rational. She's the leader. She's, in some sense, the puppet master, the one who controls the action of the novel a lot of the time. So it's interesting that that character seems to want to put herself in the position of a dependent by finding a mother figure. So it seems even though these clones have been brought into the world without a family, and even though the possibility of family is denied them, they still seem to instinctively reach out for each other. They need each other. The title of the novel is Never Let Me Go. But there's a second subtle way in this novel that Ishiguro challenges our confidence in ideas like self-government, individual agency, freedom, and independence. So let's think about this for a second. These students at Hailsham are mortal, just like us, and throughout the novel they have to come to grips with their own mortality. But the reason these young people face such an aggressive timeline is precisely because there are other people out there in the world who refuse to accept their mortality. So we know there's these people out there harvesting organs in order to stay alive. It's a grotesque image, but I think in particular this is a grotesque, exaggerated image of the ways in which we are not self-sufficient, that we actually rely on other people. In particular, the people who live outside Hailsham rely on the bodies of the people who live inside Hailsham. The idea that we have achieved mastery over life, that we have achieved comfort or security for ourselves by ourselves is often flawed. And through the clones, Ishiguro prompts us to gaze upon the people who suffer so that others can take control of their own lives. In the world of the novel, the freedom and independence of some people is enabled, made possible by the suffering of other people. And this is also true in the world outside the novel, in our world. Now the obvious example that might occur to us is class, that the lives of the super rich are made possible, are made so free by the labor of other people. But it's not just billionaires we're talking about, right? The technology we're using right now to make this video, to watch this video, is maybe powered by batteries that are mined under brutal conditions, maybe even using child labor. The clothes we're wearing, where did they come from? So there are ways that we are like the students at Hailsham. We too are mortal and spend our time trying to work out the meaning of our lives and desperately pursue intimacy and art and entertainment. But in other ways, the power dynamics of this novel suggest that we might be more like the people outside Hailsham. Because maybe our good, our safety, our security, our prosperity, maybe all those things are made possible off the suffering of others. Tough pill to swallow. Thanks everybody. Talk soon.